Case in point, I'm sure everyone here has, uh, 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 has at least heard of, of the BMPs, and specifically of the BMP2 trial. In this case, this was uh, a trial that was aimed to improve open fracture healing. This was the best study published in the uh, Journal of Bone Joint Surgery. Otherwise, a very well done study. Um, in this particular case, 450 patients, multi-center, multinational, well-funded, primary outcome revision, and basically it was uh, taken to FDA and approved because of these particular findings. They found that BMP2 open fractures reduced the risk of having a reoperation by 59% when compared to control group. In this case, we had 12 out of 135 patients had a reoperation versus 29 out of 139, and the p-value was 0.02. Looking back at our example, this is a red box. This is exactly that type of nervous study, which is too small, which by simply taking a few events, in this case, just three different outcomes, if they had switched the other way, would have changed this to a significant, to a non-significant finding. This trial would not have been given FDA approval, and we would not be seeing it used in these patients um, around North America anyway, for sure. Um, so you can see just how lucky we get when we do research and we do small trials. So remember this. Large trials with greater number of outcomes are more likely to be valid than smaller studies with fewer outcomes. Is there a solution to this problem? Well, the goal is we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. We should just realign the wheel. At the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, we did a study with some folks at Harvard University. And basically, as you can imagine, very intuitive. If you want to publish articles that have impact in the field, we should conduct multi-center studies with a high level of evidence in large sample size. Again, very intuitive, but how are we going to do this? Salim Yusuf, uh, who was a pioneer uh, and, a, and a, again, a, a, an absolute a giant in cardiology trials, talked about this seminal paper on why do we need large sample trials in cardiology. This is an example of a trial that we did, a larger trial, 1,200 patients with tibial shaft fractures, looking at a very fundamental question, renal or non-renal tibial mailing. And you can see here, that in the first 100 patients, which is the average size of most orthopedic clinical trials, we would have found, if we stopped that trial early, that we would have suggested that the non-rain nail is better or than the rain nail in the treatment of tibial shaft fractures with respect to closed tibial shaft fractures. When we got to about 400 patients, we would have concluded there's no difference. And it wasn't until we actually recruited our 1,200 patient that we concluded what our final result that was published in the Journal of World Surgery larger surgery was, which was that renal nail uh, reduced the risk of having a reoperation of one year compared to unrenaling. But you can see the problems of stopping these trials when they're very small numbers. I mean, you can have completely different answers, and that's why we need large numbers to do this. Why do our trials fail? Well, we have inexperienced teams, we don't have good study design, we have poor execution, and we don't have the money to do them right. Let's look at what's happening in cardiology. This is a study by a colleague of mine at McMaster who published this recently in The Lancet. A very large data blocker study in 190 hospitals, 23 uh, countries. Um, and you can see here, I want you to notice two things. Number of hospitals and number of countries. This is, this is what's happening in other fields. Let's look at the cardiology again. I'm a McMaster uh, trial. I'm still in use of 13,000 patients randomized, 447 hospitals, 41 countries. How about osteoporosis? 408 centers and 5,000 patients. What seems to be the ongoing trend here? The ongoing trend is that they have figured out what we need to be doing in our, in our own field, which is we need to be doing very large studies with lots of centers. So in this particular case, yes, we can do these trials. We can do it in any particular area, but we just have to have lots of centers. This particular trial that we published, which is a large trial, uh, in this case, only had 29 clinical sites. If we had had 290 clinical sites, we would have been able to successfully recruit tens of thousands of patients. So you can see the problem and the challenge of doing this type of research. But ultimately, what is the future? And where might uh, we all fit into this? Well, we have to do trials that are sufficiently large. We have to have patient important outcomes. We have to have blinded and independent assessment of fracture healing or outcomes in general, any outcome. And we have to be adequately funded. We have to develop these global trial networks. We have to have quality assurance. We have to have improved education and ultimately innovative strategies to design these endpoints. This is what's happening around the world. What's been happening is we have a number of small centers 
the small groups do these trials. What we need to be doing is converting them to working under one global unit. But beyond this, beyond this, this is a very narrow line. What we need to be doing is investing in other countries. We need to be investing in other groups um, in other areas uh, around the world, including the Philippines, to do these very large studies. The case in point, I'll give you the case of India and China, and I'll speak a little bit about what the opportunities in the Philippines could be. 40% of the world's population in two countries. You know, road traffic accidents, as we know, as per trauma, as an example, are going to be the third leading cause of disability by 2020 worldwide. It's going to be the second leading cause in developing nations. China, as you know, the population of 1.3 billion uh, people went from 60,000 accidents per year to over 50 million accidents per year in the past 50 years. When we talk about growth, we see that India in the next uh, few decades will actually likely, based on trends, become the most populous country in the world. A car accident in India is reported every three minutes and a death every 10 minutes on an Indian road. This is a very typical look, and I suspect that uh, there are uh, parts all over the world in all nations that have very similar pictures. These are pictures taken from a you know, small camera on a you know, literally 30 minute time period over the highway. But you can see that the type of things that we're seeing that are not uh, yeah. probably uh, problematic, uh, well, clearly problematic in India. But what is the opportunity? And this is what, what we see here. The Indian Society for Research and Orthopedics was uh, developed. Over 65 centers now recruit 8,000 post tibial shaft fractures and 8,500 open tibial shaft fractures because of the volume of, uh, of, of fractures they're seeing. What they need to now do is develop the appropriate funding and infrastructure uh, to allow these sort of networks to be flourishing. Uh, certainly, no uh, surprise to this audience here uh, that the Philippines also has a burden of trauma. 90 million persons, approximately one in 11 deaths, is due to injury, and they've seen a 925 percent increase in injury-related deaths in the past 35 years. So clearly, as one specific topic, injury, uh, and the burden of trauma. You can see also there's a major opportunity uh, for you uh, in, as well. The one lesson I think we should remember is that we have to be careful about these trials. For example, the BMP2 trial, which spent millions and millions of dollars, and the majority of the patients in that particular trial that got it FDA approved were uh, centers that were recruited in Africa. But the reality was that not a single patient in Africa has had access to BMP since uh, because of the cost these particular products. So I think you have to be very careful and ethical and say this is enough. And we have to be inclusive with the trials that we do uh, to ensure uh, that we have appropriate and ethical behavior in our trials. One simple example, think of very common things. Uh, one thing that we've evolved is a simple uh, trial of open versus, uh, sorry, uh, fluid lavage of open wounds. In this particular case, we ask a simple question. Does using a high pressure or low pressure of irrigating fluid in open wound have an impact on infection rates in the operation? Also, does adding soap, is simply soap by pennies, of, uh, pennies uh, per patient, uh, actually have an impact on reoperation? Uh, and again, by including this very simple design, we can have a dramatic global impact because it won't be a, uh, dependent on costs of the product. It will simply be a small technical change that could potentially lead to a dramatic, dramatic improvement in patient care. So to recap, what we know is EBM is definitely here to stay. We know that orthopedic trials have historically been challenged, and they continue to be challenged. And it's until we move to this global picture to do these large trials that we won't necessarily see the real uh, benefit of, of the therapies that we're applying. We do know that the trial is a changing. We need to do large, definitive trials in the surgical field. I think we have to look to our emerging partners in developing nations, and I think we have to absolutely capitalize on the key strength, which is the human resource uh, in many of these areas. And I have to leave you with two slides. In life, you can basically take on the issue of surgical research and evidence-based practice and just sort of put your toe in the water and just watch, you know, and be very cautious. Or you can jump in. And as I, what I suggest to you in my closing argument is let's not put our toe in the water. Let's absolutely jump into research and evidence-based practice uh, with, the, with the POA behind it with a big, big splash. Thank you very much.